So I guess a good point to, to start with is that in 2016, there was just over $20 trillion um, allocated to financial products globally that were claiming some form of ESG alignment. By 2020, this number had grown to about 35 trillion, and Bloomberg Intelligence reckons that by 2025, it is likely to exceed 50 trillion dollars. And the momentum for this kind of investing has grown as attention has increasingly been drawn to ESG issues. The COVID pandemic was obviously a major wake up for all of us, but so were all the natural disasters. We've had fires, floods, droughts, heat waves. There have been so many references to worst on record. And social issues have increased in prominence too. We've had um, Me Too and Black Lives Matter and in many other countries in the world, we've had sort of spontaneous outbreaks of human rights frustration that have spilled over into protests and violence. But it does feel as if, as our attention has been drawn to these issues, um, we have also started to think more in terms of our responsibility, both to each other and to our collective future. And in Australia, from an investment perspective, we are definitely seeing this, this playing out. The majority of us now simply expect our investments to be managed ethically and responsibly. And a recent survey by Investment Trends found that eight in every 10 Australians either already invest or plan to invest in responsible or ESG options. And interestingly, perhaps counterintuitively, this hasn't been driven, this demand has not been driven by the millennials or, or you know, the younger generations. It's been driven by the pre-retirees and the retirees, unless perhaps they're being nudged by their children. Unsurprisingly, the increase in demand has been more than matched by an increase in supply. I suppose it's part of a fund manager's DNA to recognize opportunities and to act to take advantage. You probably wouldn't even want to invest with a fund manager that didn't have this instinct. But what we are seeing recently is a, a, um, a trend whereby managers are attaching an acronym or a catchphrase to either the name or the description of both new and existing funds which imply that the managers are doing something responsible when they manage the money. In 2021 in Europe, the European Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation was introduced, SFDR regulation, and as the name implies, um, this regulation governs how a manager can describe the ethical or sustainable characteristics of their strategy. There's a, there's a set classification. But Morningstar have flagged that since the introduction of this regulation, more than 1,800 funds have upgraded their classification, indicating that they either integrate ESG to a greater extent or that they um, have more of a focus on sustainability. But many of these upgrades have not been accompanied by any changes to the investment policy. So buyer beware. So th the trend is firmly in place. We're well past the tipping point. And this massive flood of money has exposed a number of issues that we need to be aware of and we need to take into account when making investment decisions. Many of these issues are overlapping. Um, so I've tried to categorize them in terms of both intention and consequence. It's not an, exclu uh, an exhaustive list, but that only give me 10 minutes to talk today. So we'll, we'll start with greenwashing, impact washing, SDG washing or rainbow washing as, as some people refer to it. Um, these all refer to claiming responsible characteristics that don't actually exist. Another word for this is lying, which is why I've included it in my egregious category. 
And if you think about who suffers here, it's not the greenwashers. They're getting business they otherwise wouldn't be getting. First and foremost, it's the clients who don't get the experiences that they sign up for. This reflects badly on the advisors who recommend the products and ultimately on the authentic fund managers as investors could lose confidence in our proposition. But if we take a step back and think more broadly, we're all worse off because the money that was earmarked for positive investments has now been misdirected. Fortunately, this issue is well recognized and measures are being put in place to address it. Two of the most high profile examples are referenced on the slide and just last week the offices of DWS in Germany, that's Germany's largest asset manager, they manage almost a trillion dollars, um, was raided by the police and the CEO has been forced to resign. There were so many examples I could have selected in the misleading category, but the scale of GFANS, or the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, made it difficult to overlook. This is Mark Carney's initiative. He is, or he was, the governor of the Canadian Central Bank and more recently the governor of the Bank of England. And at the, the conference of the parties in Glasgow, he stood up next to Larry Fink from BlackRock, who was endorsing this plan. And he made the statement, which is, which is on the slide, and for people at the back, you, you may not be able to read it, so I'll read it now. He says, until now, there has not been enough money in the world to fund the transition to renewable energy by 2050. But thanks to GFANS, we now have all the money that we need. The lack of a credible near-term plan makes it very difficult to distinguish this from greenwashing. There's not a fresh pool of money, and most of the money can't even be allocated because it's already allocated elsewhere. Um, a lot of it to, to home loans, some of it even to fossil fuel infrastructure. There's plenty of double counting. It seems to miss the distinction between asset owners and asset managers, and there is no minimum standards for signatories. So the risk here is, you look at the headlines, you, you listen to the statement and you think we're well on our way, but the reality is very different. Next we have surprising, or perhaps not surprising, to Elon Musk's 96 million followers on Twitter. Tesla out of the S&P 500 ESG index, ExxonMobil in. Now Tesla is far from a, a paragon of corporate virtue, there's plenty of room for improvement. But it's very hard to imagine that ExxonMobil is a more suitable alternative. But rules are rules, so buyer beware. And if you think that this is just an S&P 500 ESG index issue, think again, it's far broader than that. I expect that investors um, in products tracking the Dow Jones Sustainability Index may be surprised by some of their exposures too. In the early 2000s, companies started to produce data to enable their stakeholders to assess the impact of their operations. And the analysis of this data became known as environmental, social and governance analysis. And today we have dozens of external agencies supplementing this data, providing ratings and benchmarks. It's become a, a, a mess of a multi-billion dollar industry. But unfortunately, this hasn't increased the clarity around, it hasn't, it, it, it hasn't created a, cl a clearer playing field. And that is because there is no generally accepted definition of what good ESG looks like. Everyone looks at different factors, everyone weights them differently, everyone assesses them differently. And the result is the, the kind of, of um, noise that you can see on the, on, on the left-hand graph here. Um, there is huge differentiation between the ratings. And to a certain extent, this undermines the value of the process. Because with this much noise, companies are less likely to try and improve their ESG credentials. It is also harder to link the, 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 the remuneration, the compensation of executives to improvements in ESG performance. And um, in the investment industry, we see managers shopping around for the right ESG rating to present their credentials in the most favorable light. 
Regulation is also confusing. I've already spoken about the, the sustainable finance disclosure regulations. In Europe, it's part of their overall legislative package, and Europe is leading the way. But this hasn't been... Um, plain sailing. There's been plenty of confusion around the, the European legislation as well. In BNP's 2021 ESG report, they highlighted the fact that more than half of the industry still don't understand um, the SFDR regulations or the impact that these will have on their organisation. There is a lot of concern from the industry that the data requirements are so onerous that this is just going to become a box checking exercise that's going to be outsourced to, um, to the data vendors. And another concern is that it will legitimise greenwashing as managers seek to upgrade their SFDR classifications without making changes to the investment process. In Australia, we currently have no overarching framework for ESG legislation, but it's coming, all the signs are there. And when it does, we can only hope that we have learned lessons from the international experiences and we are able to avoid as many of these issues as possible. So I guess in conclusion, the, the point I'd really like to make is responsible investing isn't going anywhere. It is the new normal, but like everything that is new. It's going to say, take some time and effort to actually understand it, to integrate it, and to iron out the kinks. And I'm sure we'll get there, but until we do, there is no substitute for detailed due diligence and a healthy dose of common sense. Thank you very much.